Okay. Now, just picking up uh, from where we had left last time, I was talking about um, the approach to accumulated knowledge, expert knowledge, accumulated knowledge, reliable source, reliable theory, you know, the difference in approach between this uh, Vedic philosophers and the and science. Because Vedic philosophers think that Veda is immutable, infallible, and you can only have, only thing is you can be creatively interpreted. And that's how many schools of Darshana come. But the thought of the expression in Veda itself is, is uh, infallible and immutable and uh, and uh, non-human in origin, it's a revelation, etc. Whereas the as we discuss, uh, like science uh, doesn't believe that. He says established theory has very is very important, and uh, you know, and you establish a theory gets established only after minute uh, verification from various angles. So unless a new theory comes and expands the domain of validity. Uh, and uh, and so on, just like we discussed about Newtonian and Einsteinian physics, etc. So like that, then we cannot uh, we cannot uh, you know we cannot accept some new idea just because it is new. And first, we will we will verify with existing knowledge, and we'll accept it only if it shows that it is a better theory. It ex it explains more things than all the existing theories. Okay, and. Hopefully, it will make some predictions of uh, things which uh, um, which are not yet been uh, discovered. Okay, so that is the ultimate thing. If you predict something and it has not been found so far, and you find it, uh, that is a great achievement of the theory. So there have been several cases like that uh, in physics. Uh, so that's what established those theories as as uh, correct theories. Okay, now, uh, but otherwise. Uh, no, that no, process no. itself shows that it uh, while it, it, okay, it looks at accumulated knowledge as a very important really source of verification, no, it doesn't consider it as infallible. There is one fundamental thing. Now, but let's look at, so, see, there are, uh, when we say science is based on observation, experiment, verifying through a test, verifiability is very important. You can't make a statement which cannot be verified. So if you make a statement, okay, and there is no test to verify it, then there is no point in discussing it. That's what science says. So when people talk about existence of God, existence of ghosts and spirits, etc., etc., all these types of supernormal, so paranormal or, or uh, so supernatural okay. phenomena, etc., what scientists say is that, no, you can't, you know, if you make a statement which cannot be verified, if there is no experiment to verify it, then we have nothing to say about it because for us, the methodology of testing something is through an experiment. Okay. So, uh, um, uh, verifiability of a statement means there should be a test to verify it becomes very important. But otherwise, we should also, but the, the human mind, how it interacts with its environment, how it comes to so-called understand it, Okay, uh, gains knowledge of its environment, etc. It has its own process and it is very natural and we see it from children onwards. They don't have to study Pramana Shastra or science or any anything, right? They have a way of uh, understanding things besides what is being taught to them by the elders, by the culture, by society. But through their own experience, how do they uh, uh, experience and using certain logic how do they come to certain conclusions? The conclusions might prove wrong later. That doesn't matter. But they come to certain conclusions based on certain things. So in that, it is inevitable that all three pramanas are involved. So in fact, what we can say is this, like any Shastra, Shastra puts everyday occurrences, observes them minutely and puts, puts them in a systematic fashion. Okay, it's not that everyday occurrences follow this. You are analyzing the everyday occurrences, everyday phenomena, and you, for analytical purposes, you break them into two, three, four, five parts and say, this is the stages, these are different things, and each one of them has a certain weightage, etc. Okay, just like we, we talked about earlier uh, on, on the production of the, of the thought, 
the expression of thought through walk uh, and so on or even the writing process etc etc okay it's not that every time you speak you you, you don't think oh para pashanti madhyama vaikari and all that right it is a, it's a analytical method and uh, now similarly this this direct observation and uh, even being self critical about your own direct observation saying oh did i really see that you know should i believe that or something is wrong with my eyes something is wrong with my ears i heard this and so on this is one part this happens and even anumana this inference or guessing or speculation that is also part of your uh, thought process it's not that some philosopher has to teach you right so this 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 uh, simple example that is given of fire and smoke all that is actually part of your uh, psyche of everybody's psyche it doesn't have to know sanskrit or nyaya shastra or, or any such thing right it's part of the the way human beings interact and gain knowledge what is called if you uh, the technical name for it is epistemology that what is knowledge who is the knower how does he gain the knowledge and all that it is a very intricate uh, science and nyaya shastra is many times called indian logic but it is not just logic it is also epistemology okay uh-huh. that is it goes deeply into what is knowledge who is the knower what is the process of knowing etc okay so and that is a very uh, detailed discussion they get into and on that issue also there are there are uh, there is continuous polemics with uh, uh, different uh, uh, shastras different darshanas especially buddhist and so on okay and even vedantis so <clears throat> i don't think we'll get into all that so looking at something like science now what are the problems in science what is the domain of science what i call as uh, whatever you want to study you are you have to distance yourself from it so it's called objectification that subject object there has to be a distance you are examining something that something cannot be you right you meaning your own psyche or something like that the observer and the observed there has to be distance between them that's what gives it certain objectivity whereas uh, so that is why when you are dealing with matter or anything di- away from you different it could be another conscious person it could be somebody uh, some other individual you can you may be examining his behavior or his uh, characteristics etc but basically it is not you so the problems problem comes only when you are talking about your inner world your inner working your own psyche your mind your thought processes etc or feelings then the problem comes because are you able to distance yourself from all those and it is very difficult to distance yourself from your own feelings so how do you analyze your feelings so this becomes here it where the 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 science methods become iffy okay so that is why science will not even get into that there may be some neurologists who will say oh the, this you are feeling good because of some endorphins and you know some um, things are being secreted in a certain part of your brain etc okay but that's that's another way of saying actually i don't, i don't know why you are feeling good but uh, uh, the 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 feeling of good goodness is coming because some some hormone has been uh, released etc okay or some chemical has been released in your brain but uh, but that is that's one uh, one thing so that is why the the issue of feelings the issue of your inner world the science natural science does not get into that's why it's called natural science it deals with nature that nature which is outside of you okay and in the case of if you are observing society if you are observing human beings etc then you call them social sciences or humanities it could be literature it could be psychology it could be you know economics it could be sociology anthropology and so on right but natural science methods are on sure footing when you are dealing with matter and not consciousness so consciousness one consciousness studying another consciousness becomes uh, very iffy okay so a lot of speculative uh, and uh, i um, exercises are involved in it so whereas in the case of dealing with matter 
you say the uh, observation experiment etc is the final test for your theory and and but at the same time it is not just observation and experiment observation observation of planetary motion led to uh, kepler discovering that there are elliptical orbits that means you saw some pattern in your data and that you called as a law because you saw that almost many planets follow that so you made it into a law law meaning everybody else also if you know must be doing this step generalizing it from some number of cases you generalize it but there are many things in science in even everyday science leave aside atomic and molecular physics or cosmology or astrophysics things which are even in front of you you when you talk about a concept when you are making a model what may be happening in there that's not based on any uh, data it is a, it's a, it's a construct of your mind okay that is not based on data so already you have created something which you cannot really test you cannot see, uh, you know really like it's not verifiable that way your intermediate concept okay for example the theory of atoms now all of us think oh we are all made of atoms and so, no that, what can be more scientific than that but what is an atom when did the concept of atom come if you look at that initially leave aside the ancient concepts of atom okay but even modern concepts from dalton onwards what you see is that atomic atomic theory okay that did people really see atoms did people really see molecules no so the concept of the atom and concept of like the bond between two atoms and creating molecules etc etc they were mental constructs it is only only with first you can say nowadays of course now i got a very 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 powerful microscope electron microscopes called atomic force microscopes in which you can see layers of atoms okay not really a single atom but a few atoms you can you can sort of um, you can make a map of them okay and uh, which becomes visually appealing basically you are getting a lot of uh, you know reflected transmitted electromagnetic waves from that you create a Uh, create a kind of a picture and you say oh the, this is uh, this is like the, it looks like a few billiard balls you know sitting here and they are the layer of atoms etc right but actually <laughs> that is something to for you to um, uh, for you to you know um, identify it as as some particle or some sitting there um, uh, and that is not exactly uh it is it, the instrument is just collecting reflected transmitted electromagnetic waves <laughs> okay and uh, uh, could be diffraction patterns you know all sorts of things like that so from that you are you are concluding so actually it is a, it is a secondary tertiary way of saying that uh, this is an atom and this is a picture of the atom etc okay but originally it was actually uh, it was i think uh, i'm not sure about this guy he was a bot botanist who was uh, observing a, a, a piece of uh, a bit of pollen in a, in a in a petri dish under microscope and i think it was hook uh, and he found that this pollen was jiggling why is it continuously jiggling right and then uh, i think a person called brown his name was got associated with it and this was called brownian motion this random motion of the small particles which are floating in water now it is only with uh, nobody understood why this is happening okay it looked like as if you are watching uh, uh, so a model was made later with kinetic theory of fluids that there are mo water molecules which are hitting it from all sides and if the hit from one side is more powerful than the hits from other side then the pollen is moving uh, a little bit to the um, to one side and so on so that is why so since there are random uh, attacks on that pollen from molecules all around the the molecules themselves you don't see but you see the pollen under microscope and the pollen is jiggling pollen is jiggling and this was verified you can say theoretically Uh, the exact uh, pattern and the motion uh, of this uh, pollen uh, pollen was was explained by einstein 
in 1905. 1905 is the most productive year of Einstein. He, he, yeah, I mean, the 1905, 1906, 1907, and especially 1905, almost you can say his, his lifetime work is done there. Okay, in the five, five famous papers he wrote. And uh, it was a great year for physics and great year for Einstein also. And they were all breakthroughs. So one of them actually explained, was a, he was able to explain exactly why this particular jiggling motion is happening and how much it is happening. You know, uh, this, uh, what is random uh, about it. And he tried to describe this randomness uh, through the Boltzmann distribution, etc. Okay. Uh, using the kinetic theory concepts there. Nothing uh, um, that way, uh, quantum mechanical or any such thing. Okay. So that, you can say, is an indirect evidence for the existence of molecules. You are saying molecules are hitting it. You are not saying molecules. So it is like saying, suppose you are watching a football match and all the lights go away, but the football itself is fluorescent. So you can see the football and you see the football running all over the place. Right? And you, but because the lights are off, you don't see any, any players. Then somebody comes and says, oh, don't worry. I mean, you know, there are actually like uh, 22 players there and they are kicking the ball among themselves. And that is the reason the ball is going in this almost random fashion. Okay. In this uh, rectangle of the field. <laughs> it is like that. Okay. So, uh, he's, he's, uh, he's making a model of Football players kicking that ball around. So similarly, so that was the uh, so-called proof so far for the belief that there are atoms and molecules. And now you say, okay, we have seen atomic force uh, microscope uh, in that we can see these, these patterns, etc. Okay, when we put some very thin layers of uh, certain uh, uh, materials and all that. Okay, so all the time we make these models with concepts which are not really verifiable. They are speculative. That's why you call them model. Model is, 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 a, is a way, it's a mental construct. You do that as an intermediate step, but it should lead to consequences. That model should explain the results of a, of a, of a test or should, should predict uh, um, 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 uh, a behavior which you have not seen before. Okay. So it's not that science does only observation. If you are doing only observation and finding patterns, that is just like you can say data analysis. Science is much more than that. Science is modeling also. Science is theorizing also. Science is generalization also. Generalization means what? Actually, you do not see uh, all cases, right? You see two, three, four, five, ten cases and say, then you generalize. You say, oh, this apply, they, if we, this pattern applies to all cases which belong to this, 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 this type of uh, uh, thing and so on. Okay. And this happens all the time. And this is embedded in our language. You, you see the word when you talk, when you teach a child that, that this is a tree. What does it see? It doesn't see a tree. A tree is a class, class of objects. You may be pointing to one particular tree. You may be pointing to a, a, a coconut tree. Okay. So it is actually seeing a coconut tree. But a coconut tree again is an abstraction, is a class. He is seeing one particular coconut tree. Okay. From that, he is actually reaching to a generalization of, and when you say that is another, he point to another coconut tree and say that is also a coconut tree. So then he says, Array, that is taller than this one. That is having some fruits also. But what is common between these two? Okay. So what is common between these two is what, what I am being told is a coconut tree. So this is not this coconut tree, but there is something called a coconut tree. Okay. And from there, there is something called a tree, a class, a class of objects. So these are all generalizations and we do it through language and you know, one year old, two year old children, we are teaching them. Right. A pen. This is a pen. Now, what is this pen? Then you point to another ballpoint pen, another like fountain pen, another colored pen, and you say that is also a pen. The child, how is it able to grasp that this pen, that pen, this pen, that pen, all of them are the same object called pen. So there is something called penness. <laughs> it is understood something called penness, a property of all, common to all these objects. Right? So these are all what? 
these are all abstractions these are all mental models okay so it's not just some observation there is there is uh, our our in our own everyday life we use many such uh, uh, things uh, to 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 convey a concept or to model a world or understand the world uh, and and so on so uh, it's not enough to say oh science you know believes in experiment and observation etc okay science also does all these other things uh, which is modeling which is actually a creative uh, leap uh you 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 use a lot of mental constructs which are not observable which cannot be tested except for their consequences so because you can only check the consequences then you say you work backwards and say oh this this concept led to those consequences so this concept has some reality but somebody else might come with another set of concepts and still explain the same consequences then what do you choose you have two contending theories you say right and so on so actually this uh, this uh, uh, and similarly as i already mentioned you look at established theory or accumulated knowledge so far accumulated understanding so far because we have uh, human beings have this this whole uh, have developed this thing of uh, a generation passing on its knowledge uh, its behavior its culture etc to the next generation right through the system in the family in the schools in the society and so on so there is a generational transfer of of, of knowledge okay which only to a very uh, elementary extent you may be able to see it in animals but in human beings it is something which is which is what we call education okay uh, uh, which is also called there is a collective memory collective consciousness and that is being transferred to the next generation of a person who comes into being is only 2 year old but he starts getting all that accumulated things which is you know understanding which gets transferred to him so generation to generation their understanding increases why because they are as you say they are standing on the shoulders of the previous generation right that is something very uh, you can say very uh, you, uh, uh, unique or uh, peculiar to the human beings uh, and uh, and this uh, this transfer of knowledge so there is uh, there is a, a production of knowledge creation of knowledge transfer of knowledge you know so uh, this uh, uh, so we this accumulated knowledge becomes established and once it is established uh, the knowledge also and along with it it's not just some information along with it the models which are uh, which are given that correct knowledge which you call theory right so you look at that as your veda as a pramana something you don't know you go and refer to that you go to a library and read a book you see oh it has come in the textbook you know that means it is already verified knowledge etc right so that means it is a reliable source so this issue of reliable source which the sankhya philosophers called as apta vakya they didn't call it veda they call it shabda or apta especially apta vakya apta means the a person who says who describes a thing as it is it is called yathartha whatever is there he is telling you whatever he has seen he is telling you okay now if it is an object it is different but if it is his experience then it becomes a little subjective he experienced ananda he experienced brahman he experienced certain you know uh, higher state of uh, mind he experienced samadhi etc okay now those are the things and at the same time then you say these are anirvachaniya they cannot be converted into words they cannot be converted into language they cannot be described even okay so uh, those those are the gray areas where a scientific mind for that it becomes very problematic you will have to say okay that is that person's experience okay theek hai because you are looking for objectivity universality and so on so if you say i am feeling hungry and then you see some other person hungry now hungry is not an object it is a feeling right it is a state of your body now if another person who is also away who has not had his food for such a amount of time he also feels hungry so then you associate not having food leading to hunger so a feeling which has been produced 
by uh, by uh, uh, you know similar circumstances leading to certain feeling it then becomes uh, transferable communicable okay uh, and the remedy is also there oh you're feeling hungry chalo ek khalo right so a feeling also can be an objective thing right because many people get the same feeling because they are in the same uh, uh, same circumstance but if you say i had a dream or i i i had a revelation only you had it and you can't even as give a algorithm saying if you do this step this step this step this step you'll achieve that because people say okay you got something lovely i also want to get it tell me how to achieve it and then you say you know you are not able to give that algorithm okay in any uh, you can say precise terms you'll just say i say sadhana karte raho karte raho and this that 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 and you you put some impossible impossible uh, sort of conditions right for example yoga says uh, that uh, literally uh, yoga chitta vritti nirodha patanjali sutra starts with that chitta vritti now that means literally you have to still your mind the mind should not have there should not be anything inside the mind no waves no vibrations no thoughts no nothing okay that is like the aim now i can't even imagine a mind which is that still right i mean i have never experienced it neither can i imagine it it can be you know for a few seconds you may be in some trance or you might you may be um, you know totally forgetting about your everything else Uh, of your life or of your existence, etc., and might get immersed in something, or you might. Uh, uh, so it's a you are talking about a transcendental phenomena, a transcendental state. That means you are transcending your state and getting into another state. Now that state, how you are going there, and what is in that state, can't be described by sitting in this state. So then, how will you tell the other person this is samadhi or this is where? you you uh, you had this realization and revelation etc okay so whereas if you say oh in the uh, when you are uh, you know ups and downs euphoria and uh, and uh, sadness all that you should maintain your balance and all that you know sthita pradyam means this etc etc the you know to a certain extent people can understand but this transcendental states of and transcendental objects like atma soul or a transcendental thing called brahman and again the thing when then you say it is not a thing it is not this it is not that it is not that neti 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 that is the way you try to describe these things so which me which means for a person who needs a, a, an algorithm or a step by step approach to achieve something or a person who wants to verify something a person who wants to have um, uh, the same uh, uh, you know um, reproduce the same result that you had in your uh, laboratory let us say that a labor in cambridge cavendish laboratory something happened uh, you know rutherford did an experiment and you can do it here in your college lab and also you can see the same uh, result or similar result uh, you can come to the same same conclusion so that kind of thing is not possible in this so there is a uh, because you are not dealing with matter here you are primarily dealing with consciousness states of consciousness and certain transcendental states and so on so people who say that science and, uh, and this metaphysics is the same and both are uh, you know both can be somehow combined uh, i i do not understand that for me these are two different worlds okay so i think um, anyway will um, this is my understanding i may be wrong Uh, and uh, this is what i have uh, gathered and uh, i'll continue this um, this uh, study and as we go along uh, we'll discuss again um, some of these uh, darshanas and uh, peculiarly uh, what were their argumentation etc okay thank you okay okay fine yeah